of Zucoins and Zucas. Still having a few issues with that um, little man that I like to see, but uh, one day I'll sing it to you, that song, uh, the internet. But there you go. That's the problems that we have sometimes uh, from time to time. Today is the 7th of October, 2021. Today is a day where we've got a episode 18, and today's heading is called In Crypto We Trust. Uh, so In Crypto We Trust. It's been a topic that I've uh, looked forward to uh, bringing to your attention today, um, and I hasn't been quite sure how to approach it because it's uh, quite an interesting one that I wanted to show clearly the distinction between uh, who to trust or what to trust. So I thought, firstly, let's talk about those words in crypto we trust. They were actually immortalized and still are on the American dollars, uh, American currency. But the words are in God we trust. So that's the starting point for me today, everybody, in talking about the nature of fiat, nature of currency, and the distinction, therefore, between what is the better um, uh, component to trust, if you like. One On the one hand, you have crypto, and I'm talking specifically now, when I talk crypto, I'm going to talk about decentralized crypto, because for me, there's only Bitcoin in that space, uh, and then we say Zucoins is uh, hunting it down. So we're looking at the trust element of that versus the trust element of uh, in this instance, the American currency or any currency in the world. And what does that mean? Because that means that we're looking to trust the powers to be behind that, uh, those currencies, a la governments and bureaucracy. So I sort of thought then, um, let's talk about the, the nature of those words uh, on the American currency, in God we trust. It's um, Now, for me as a Christian, uh, of course, we, uh, we trust in God and uh, our faith is in his hands and uh, that's why you know the journey that i talk about uh it's just the end game we know the results and if those are believers well you've you've got no downside into where you're going um for those that have other gods and beliefs uh and those that may be uh, atheist and those that believe in the uh, nature etc etc um i think the words in god we trust on a currency can be quite deceptive and misleading, in fact, because it's trying to suggest no matter what your faith or anybody's faith is, that somehow the advertising material that supports that currency uh, is backed by God or whoever God we talk about. So just think about that. In God we trust, trying to promote. Now, that came about in 1956. That change was introduced in America, uh, you know, in relation to uh, giving support to the financial system, in fact. Well, it's very odd when you think that uh, God doesn't support uh, mankind's uh, quest for uh, money and mankind's, uh, the way in which we behave and have behaved around the world and, and the issues between states and governments and countries and all the rest of it. Uh, but suddenly it appears on the currency. So what they're asking us to do is to have trust in that financial system based on the fact that uh, God's endorsed it. So there's an endorsement, which is quite wrong. Very wrong indeed. But uh, that's taken for granted. So have a look at the, the currency and you'll see those words there. Now, what do we see if we say in crypto we trust? Well, now that's the interesting starting point. The interesting starting point there is that there is no, uh, in the case of truly decentralized crypto, so let's not go down the road of the other 6,000 coins out there and security tokens and those sort of uh, you know, concepts because they are circling back in to be decentralized through some shape or form through blockchain and they have participants behind them. So if we categorize, we say, just Bitcoin and certainly just Zucoin, the only thing you're having trust in is the system itself. That is the computer algorithms and the network. There are, there are, there are no human input that's put that pushed behind and there's no need to market anything of who you need to trust when you're involved in that space that decentralized space the trust is in relation to simply the the continuation that's to put in place as a result of software and algorithms and computer systems now the interesting thing of that is that when you start to think about 
uh, a software program as easy as a code saying one plus one equals two, the computer doesn't go off on its own little tangent and have some sort of uh, concepts like human, the human mind does and sees whether or not there's a discretion into maybe that maths changes or uh, will we rely on that maths or are there other issues that could affect that formula of one plus one equals two? In other words, we may not wish to see that outcome uh, presented to the parties that are putting that in place. But the computer doesn't read it that way. It just says, without any interference or influences, one plus one equals two. And it does that 24-7, one plus one equals two. Now, when you look at the, the financial system and the governments, every single thing that we do today, financially, the way in which we behave, the way in which we work through our work environments, a home, family, there is always a third party human element that we need to trust. And certainly uh, we categorize those persons according to the relationships that we've had in, as a result of the trust factor that we build up. Now, you don't need that with crypto. You don't need that with Zucoins and you certainly don't need it with Bitcoin because there's nothing that can influence the outcome other than the, the retention of the value and the transfer of the value. That's all the computer algorithms are programmed to do. That's, that's the entire essence of the blockchain, or in our case, the split chain. Now, I was thinking through, I thought, well, how can I push the message about the, the influence of that trust mechanism when you're trying to deal with that at government levels and the effect that that can have and the effect that it does have in the future on your finances and the way in which uh, you treat your life trying to uh, eliminate those influences around you for the outcome being, all you want to know is that you have a balance and you have the ability to do something with that balance of value. So I was, it was sort of something that I had to come to grips with last night as to, you know, really pressing that point. Because if you think of, just think of a share, you own a share in a company. Now you can start to write a list of all the influences in relation to your investment. It can start from discussions at home with your wife or, or husband. It can start, so there's your first trust element. It can then start with your broker, your accountant, your lawyer. So there's another range of people that have influenced the decisions you're going to make. It can start with the regulators and there's another body of people again. It then starts with the exchange. It then starts with the brokers. And then the company itself, of course, you have absolutely zero control because your entire uh, investment or, or life is placed into the trust and hands of those that are running the, co the company. Now, the company itself then has to place its trust in its suppliers and creditors, uh, who it's dealing with, advertising, marketing, and suddenly the entire human race is consumed by trust. Now, if any part of that link breaks, then of course, trust breaks down and so does the outcome. If a company goes into receivership and liquidation, there are reasons on the basis of why that's happened. And those reasons could be as simple as COVID. The business closed down, the, the organisation relied on uh, government funding, uh, it had in place some monies, uh, revenues de deteriorated, the, the restaurant closed, whatever the, the business model is. And of course, you're the holder of worthless value in valueless investment. But think about the crypto. The crypto doesn't stop. The only trust element, as I said, is reliant upon the, the algorithms that are put in place that are locked in, hard-coded. And in our case in ZooCoins, that the entire network uh, is participants in that valuation uh, pr uh, program. Now, there is a, a lesser degree of trust in Bitcoin, but you've still got your trust in relation to the miners. So it's a lesser risk than the human element that I've talked about, but still there's a risk there because if the miners cease or China closes down mining operations and computers in that sense, there's lesser uh, participation in the mining process or they don't get enough fees or they run out of coins, there is a potential end date that says that may cease. And that's the inherent risk, but not as a greater risk uh, because there's no human influence, in fact, uh, in relation to that processing still relied on, on the computer uh, nodes. 
small risk because they're behind the nodes is someone has to manage those nodes uh, to keep it going. Now, in Zucoin's case, uh, if you've got a mass adoption program and you've got a billion people, well, obviously the risk reduces considerably because you only need one or two in the network uh, that keeps it alive because of the way it's processed on peer to peer. So I thought, well, the message to get across and the way in which that effect of trust in government, in the financial systems, and the way in which we've had this uh, ongoing scenario of decentralized cryptocurrencies. And the exciting thing is, of course, as I keep saying, Bitcoin is a wonderful uh, advancement in that respect. And next generation zoo coins. Uh, look at Bitcoin last night, uh, you know, it's nudging 55, 54,000 US dollars. Uh, had great news, sensational news that in 2021, this this uh, this year, uh, it's the leading uh, beacon and light as the best performing uh, asset of any class, outgunning US shares, European shares, 49% return in 12 months for 2021. Of course, in the bottom of that list, it's interesting, everything with negative returns, to press the point, is all global or government bonds, treasury. Long-term corporate bonds, long-term treasury, negative 7.2%. So is that a reflection of the trust element that I've talked about? There is less trust happening now in relation to the, the fundamentals of the currency. There's a shift in trust towards, let's just rely on the computer. I mean, the computer doesn't worry about uh, the day-to-day -day events. He's not concerned with what hap what's happening and the effects whether the share market will go down because we're worried about uh, processes with the uh, the Senate and will they pass the bills and will they provide more money because that $29 trillion debt ceiling is is racking up. It just says, I'm going I'm here to process these transactions. Now, it may fluctuate in price because you've got the participants buying and selling, but the core of it, it's not sitting there making decisions. Do we need this week to release another trillion dollars in quantitative easing to try and put a cap on inflation, monetary policy, whatever it is? So as a result of drilling down into this trust element, I thought the best possible example that I can give of the erosion of trust and where it starts, because there are other people that are managing our lives in each jurisdiction through what we call in the de democratic world, uh, governments. And that trust element, we are completely in their hands as to the effects of our daily lives and what's going to happen. So I thought what I would do is pick out four time zones in my, my story of the effect that government has had, which that effect has shown an erosion in my attitude and levels of trust of government. And because of that erosion in trust, it meant that I have gone out far deeper seeing, well, well, just how are these people behaving when they do get into parliament and they do run the country for all the rest of us and they do look at raising taxes and they do look at expending money? Why should we look at a greater trust element in that regard for the things that they want us to do, the investments that they tout and the regulations they have versus an autopilot crypto functionality called decentralized cryptocurrencies that I don't have to worry about what's what it's thinking. So I went back through my uh, little book and I thought this, there's a lot of things that when I, uh, I've, I've had this campaign for pretty well 30 years, the best part's been the last 22 against the government. And I'm circling back to the Australian government here. So let's just get a handle on and see how that ends up as to what you think the trust element should be in regards to how you see your relationship with government and bureaucrats and, uh, and, and so forth. So in my little journey back 30 years ago, uh, 26 years of age, uh, took over four public companies, and that uh, was all about asset uh, acquisition with some interesting strategies to do that and raising capital. Now, when you come out of the 87 crash, which is going to get shivers now, thinking what's going to happen in the next uh, six to 12 months, but
But nevertheless, uh, it, money was very hard to come by, very tight. So with those public companies and the chairman of those four entities, and there is some media on that because some people didn't like the way they were acquired, but nevertheless, certainly uh, we put a full full page ad at one stage to show exactly our thinking and strategy to, to set the record right. But one of the transactions was a what they call a non-beneficial change of interest. That is, the shares ownership didn't change, which were listed shares in the public company. But as a result of that, I was able to raise funds on the loan. Now, unfortunately, of course, there's laws that say if there's a non-beneficial change of interest in that share, then that's deemed, that is, it's on automatic, that you have committed an offence for market manipulation and you've got to go to court to allow the, the arbitrator, the judge, to decide which side of the fence he's on. Regulator or legal advice is that you can do this because the advice at the time was that if you have a reason and a compelling reason for why you did that transaction, which didn't affect the overall price of the market, maybe the perception, but not the overall price, didn't move, which is called an off-market transfer, then you've got a, a reason for which to put to the court that you shouldn't be uh, hit with anything or, or penalties in relation to that provision. Now, there's your first level of trust, the magistrate. Now, remember over in the background, the Bitcoin, BTC, and zoo coins, when they hit the exchanges, they don't worry about this stuff because there's no element of trust in that. It's all trusted on the computer systems. It's not worrying about a third party. But here's my first third party going into court and trusting the judiciary system. Now, it's fair to say that the magistrate, David McLennan, he's decided that he didn't like that uh, reasonings. That was his discretion and you know, that's how the judicial system works and you respect that. And he issued a penalty. He said, you've been, you know, naughty boy. You can't, if you're deemed. There's nothing I need to decide other than on balance. And on that balance, uh, the offence has been committed. And he issued a $5,500 fine. So I copped the speeding ticket. Now, what we didn't realise, but it, it eventuated during the course of the proceedings, was that, the woman that was in charge of the uh, the investigations in relation to drilling into this, you know, horrendous market manipulation transaction, which is a speeding ticket that I got, she turned out to be the wife of the magistrate. Can you believe that? I mean, it's something out of a Monty Python movie. So you'd think you could remove that untrustworthy element now of that particular magistrate that... Your wife it was the investigator that brought forward the charges. But no, no, because as a human, he has the capacity or had the capacity to decide that he won't be talking to his wife about this matter and they won't be talking at night time or when they put their heads on the pillow and that he has every uh, capability to discern himself away from the issue to continue with that outcome. Now, of course, government gets its head on that and that's the first round of mudslinging they like to do because they say, well, look at this, one of the great manipulators of the 20th century. And there you go. A $5,500 fine was the, the total. So you start to doubt in your mind the the, the trust element. You, you, you don't certainly um, say to yourself that the whole of the system is is you know, going to fall away as a result of that, so you bubble along. So then you get to the the uh, the situation as, as I move through my journey, and I'm getting right through to the the way in which the, the the bullet point out of this will be: do not ever ever trust government in any of its processes and systems, but you can start to build that trust with crypto, decentralized crypto. That's going to be the, the, the bottom hitting, hard hitting point that I want to bring through my journey. So the second one comes along and there's now I'm on the radar and all of a sudden through private unlisted public companies, we have a 1,393 shareholder business. We have, as I always do, uh, put in play that the legal advices are from 
the uh, you know the best QCs and the best lawyers, which at the end of the day, you can't use that in court to say, well, they told me I can do this. You're on your own and you're at the discretion. You put your trust back into the, the judiciary. You hope like hell. But the good news is as a betting man, which I love race sourcing, race uh, bets and things, you've got a 50-50 chance, which is not bad odds really. But along comes uh, ASIC as a result of the transactions that we had with the government when we received $8.725 million. And they come along, another body, and they say, this payment you made of $2.05 million to your private companies as a related party transaction is against the law. Well, we say, hang on, we've got advices that, A, it's reasonable remuneration. If you divide that by three people over nine years in back pay, I'm sure most people would want to get paid. And in fact, when you get the gross amount, then you've got to pay tax to the uh, tax office. So everybody has a win. But you leave it with the shareholders. So despite ratification by shareholders of 97.3%, along comes this body and convinces another judge, acting Judge Foster, and he decides he doesn't like me, so he issues the penalties and says that you've breached the related party provisions. Even though, fast forward some years later, fast forward to today, it turns out the money could never have possibly been the company's money because the the government uh, bureaucracy had breached the constitution under Section 83 and it's only recoverable as a debt against the company. So if it's not the company money, you can't have uh, related party transactions. It's impossible. It's not even the company's money. So therefore, there's no related party transactions. So the banning orders that I got are null and void, which means I've got to go back in the court to set that aside. And those are sort of the measures that I haven't given up on because of my constitutional challenge. But again, now I've been exposed to another body of people, bureaucrats and regulators who are deep pockets. In fact, it's their, your pockets that they're, they're, they're filling their hands with, taxpayers. No, no limitation on the responsibilities when they go into the courts. And when the matter went to the High Court, it's one of the great cases on testing an acting judge. And he was acting. He was an actor. He was a great actor, acting Foster. But certainly, the outcome was the banning order. So the mud starts slinging because the government's on a roll. They're saying, well, look what we've got. We've got the greatest market manipulator of shares in the 21st century. We've got him banned because he's the only banned director in the history of corporate Australia where shareholders have voted in favour of the transactions, 97.3%. But we don't care about shareholders. We're not interested in that. We're only interested in helping the government because the other bureaucrats in the other departments, they're all excited because if they can knock you out with no income, knock you out with damage and reputational damage, they're well ahead of the game. So the third thing comes along in my life, which is part and parcel of that banning issue, was we get this money from the government. And of course, what happens? We're the ones that are accused of being recipients and crooks and all the rest of it. And all we did was fill out our forms to the department, got the 8.725 million, agreed that we knew we had it and we had to be repaid. But they're not happy with that because guess what? It turns out, after all of this has happened, including the criminal trials, which we won without going to jury, God bless Chief Justice Higgins, a man who restored my trust, not just for the win, but just the, on the basis of being innocent, that you had some person in that position of trust at that level that, that sat back and used his discretion according to the law. Now, it's interesting then because you look at the case and the government says, and the finding by the great uh, Justice Rivshugi, who went against us in the judgment, the finding was that there's what's called a Barnes and Addy claim in equity against the individuals to the amount of the recovery plus interest. But he also found that it was the company money. That is, under what's called the Auckland Harbour versus King case of 1942, went to the Privy Council, 
that if you breach the Constitution on payments, Section 83, any transaction the government does in any department, in any entity, in any government enterprise that breaches Section 83, the transactions are null and void and recoverable only against the recipient. These are the company. Now, that's the point, in fact, that I want to test and will be able to test at some stage in the High Court, having gone through uh, all these little battles. And I think the ratio of battles is I think the government in the latest rounds probably won up because uh, we were, we were even Stephen there for a little while, the amount of battles that we'd each won. The biggest battle for me was the criminal, but certainly the little battles that we've had, the government's probably won up now as a result of the settlement we had to do for the House because of my wife uh, wanting to be there in her dying days. And the government has taken advantage of that. But that's the game they play. That's the game they play with your money. So the third point being this money. But it turns out the court has said that the, the contractor, David Muir, was on his own, independent, except for some little intriguing bits of those within the, the government of everybody denying they even knew him, let alone the processes that they had in play that he couldn't do what he did, that he was responsible for the transaction in breach of the Constitution. Now, your level of trust drops again because you've got this, this, this bloke, your, your life is in the hands of another judge, Justice Rivshugi. I mean, this bloke was nodding off at 2 o'clock every day. I had to make an application to the court like something out of Monty Python. I had to make an application to the court to get him removed on the basis that he didn't know what was going on because he's falling asleep. And, of course, he, he, he heard his own case and he said he wasn't falling asleep. I misconstrued the angle of his, of his eyelids on his desk that may have had the appearance of falling asleep, but, in fact, he was well attuned to the court because he made no squiggles with his pen. He's on the front page of the paper the next day. I mean, it was unbelievable. But this bloke is the bloke that my whole life was put in and, and entrusted to him as a result of that. Now, I'm coming back to each of the circumstances has a layer of trust reliant upon some third party. And it's in every part of our lives. There's not one exception to the rule. Now, the fourth part gets interesting because then the government says, you know, a report got released, which is worth looking at, actually. And that report is this one, produced in January 1999. We're making it available. We couldn't get it out for very much for reasoning. And it was an investigation into the Business Services Trust account, which is one of these little slush funds. People don't realise in Australia that the, the parliamentarians at the behest of the bureaucracy have found a way through to try and circumvent Section 83 of the Constitution. They have these little trust funds, these little entities. Some are audited, some aren't. And the report was produced about this particular one. And it's worth reading just a couple of lines. It was an analysis of how did this happen? How is it possible for a government body, which is run by the bureaucrats? And I think the analogy you should think about parliamentarians. Parliamentarians are like little buzzy flies. You know, they fly in, they fly out, they get elected, you know, like the Prime Minister gets elected through his element of trust from his other party members, and then suddenly you've got a Prime Minister. But they're little buzzy flies. And the bureaucrats, they're the ones dropping the big loads of shit. So the flies are all over the shit. But the shit doesn't go away. That stays there the whole time. The flies go in and out, but the shit stays there because they're running the they're running the country. So this report, which is an independent report, says the following. System access. There was complete control inefficiency because they were sharing the logins and IDs and passwords amongst each other in the Department of Finance. I wouldn't give you my ATM PIN number. Creation of vendor accounts. No effective access controls. Authorization of invoices, no effective seg segregation of duties, initiation of batches for payments, no effective controls. Input, the data input of the invoices, 
no controls, same participant, closing of batches, initiating of check runs, no controls, reconciliations, no reconciliations. Transactions are recorded through Finance One, controlled through the use of logins and passwords, which were shared, which gave full access to Global One and the Reserve Bank. I mean, it's staggering that you put your trust in government that purports to be having these facilities and capabilities and they're sharing passwords. As a result, transactions were appearing to be processed under a particular person's login when he wasn't even in the office. The staff responsible for transactions in processing in the BSTA had global access to all Finance One functions. Individuals could enter invoice details without authorization, initiate check runs without authorization, create and modify vendor information without authorization. There was no system controls to improve, to ensure appropriate authorization, nor were there any effective controls. And the government's throwing mud at me. We had all the paperwork about what we were doing, shareholder approvals. We had the trust and still do of our shareholders, the support, which has never gone away. Where's the trust within government? So after that, you think to yourself, hang on, we're losing $200 million of assets and mining leases and houses and all the rest of it and all the trinkets that we'd accumulated on the basis of this lot, can't even have a, a proper process in place for authorizations. You gotta be kidding. Now, that's just that report. And again, I've got to say to you, it all circled around the government and the bureaucrats with their piles of shit that run these departments that come out of the blocks and they don't care about those processes. They say they're going to put things in place and improve things, you know, over the journey. I remember that was 1999. So we get out there and we say, well, hang on, this is not good enough. You've cost us 4.3 billion US dollars on our modelling of our business. We'll sue you. Now, people laugh at that. Oh, ha, ha, it's real funny. Well, let me tell you, for 15 years, that potential damage has been in the very budgets every year since 2000 as a quantifiable contingent liability. That is, the government was worried enough to have to pay it. Now, when they got the $8 million award of, of uh, you know money recovery from the great Justice Rufshugi, who took six years to five and a half years to work out what to say. He awarded interest at Supreme Court rates, which is wonderful. Everybody's getting two or three percent, but oh no, not in the Supreme Court. We haven't worked out the legislation there, so we'll whack it at about an average of seven or seven and a half, and suddenly we owed 18 million. So even after paying back 11, as per the bankruptcy, I've only got one creditor. This myth that goes on about Endres with creditors is just an absolute myth. As I said, asset protection was put in place. And there's only one unsecured creditor I have in the world, and that is the government because of the case. And I've been resisting to pay it until I get into the High Court and expose this whole thing and reveal to everybody, don't trust the government. This is the element on the side that I say why I'm passionate with crypto, decentralised crypto, because you don't have a third party, you don't have an individual that can stuff up your life out of nowhere because of these third party elements, these, these elements of trust that you take for granted. Now, when I talk about the $4.3 billion, it'll be turned around. Instead of owing, uh, having owed the government $18 million because of Rashugi's six-year delivery time on a judgment, compounding interest, losing the house and all the rest of it. Instead of doing that, the 4.3 billion will grow by a factor of six to one to over 25 billion US dollars when I win. That's not all mine, but a fair chunk of it is, and my shareholders will be rewarded who keep me going. Why? Because they've supported me since day one. The regulators and ASIC have got not one single shareholder in that entire journey that's concerned about anything that we did and what, what we did for the company, in, even in relation to any of the payments. I mean, what fools would sit for nine years and not get paid? 
When the money comes in and it's finally payable, shareholders were happy. They knew the work we did because that trust was there and still is. Now, what's the 4.3 billion? Is that serious? Well, it must be. Let's have a look. Wow, what's this? In statement four, the financial outlook of the budget in the 2000 and 2001 Australian federal government budget, there we appear. Appendix C, statement of risks. Look at that. You can look it up yourself. The Department of Finance and Administration is involved in litigation where two counterclaims for damages have been lodged against the Commonwealth. The counterclaim by one group of defendants claims damages of $4.3 billion against the Commonwealth, although the basis upon this is yet to be provided. The other counterclaim has not specified any particular amount of damages. Well, I'll tell you what the part of that was when we subsequently filed was 16 years of not being a director. The salaries that we were earning pre-1999 were not insignificant. Now, that's in the era, just so you're clear, of the, of the, the great John Howard, the Liberals. So the Liberals were circling in relation to wanting to, I, A, remove the claim, and B, hide a bit more about what they're up to in relation to your money and how they get around it, how they get around Section 83 of the Constitution. Been around since 1901. Get to that in a moment. But let's not take Labor off the hook. I've seen the transitions of Labor, Liberal, Liberal, Labor, you know, since 1999. And we then dealt with the Labor Party. Julia Gillard. Oh, what a thrill that was. Someone fresh and new into the business. But again, the flies, in and out, in and out, all ho hovering around the droppings. The bureaucrats don't change. And then they go down the road and they put up all of their presentations. And all of a sudden, bang, it's in the report again. There it is, another statement. So where does this lead us? That's the personal experience that nobody in the Zucoin world should ever have to go through because you're going down a road where everything you have is in, entrusted with a whole raft of different people when you have this outcome that you don't need to trust other than the computer algorithms through crypto. And that in this generation is the first time where you can remove that shit and you can just say, as long as the computer knows that one plus one equals two, it will always equal two. No variation to that. And then you say, well, Al, you, you know, the government said in this instance that we don't breach Section 83 of the Constitution. That's just, that's impossible. Well, it is possible because I'd invite you to look at the Australian National Audit Office reports for, since 1999. Doesn't matter which party you're in, Labor, Liberal, on the crossbench, it doesn't matter. Because in those reports, it's horrific. And no one cares. So if you if you look at you putting your trust in government and the way this world's going in a crazy world with money, banks, banks wanting to debank you, have no accounts, access to your money, access to your privacy on transactions, surveillance across the board on the law enforcement pretext we're in for a rough ride now it could be said that alan andrews was waffling on about these breaches by the australian government well i'm going to take a bit of time now a bit extra to share some of the actual uh, items out of these australian national audit reports on the extent of these breaches that you no one out there cares but i do because if you can show that you can't trust government and you can show that you bring them in line the politicians should be held accountable. And if you don't go down that road, then it's going to make it difficult for the way in which they want to protect their fiefdoms of the very decentralised crypto that you want to have the freedom to maintain your own trust elements and integrity outside of what's happening. So let's just have a look at two little items. The first journey. 
Australian National Audit Report, number 17, 2011 to 12, Julia Gillard, wonderful Labor era, audits of financial statements of the Australian government. Treasury, these are the people that run the joint. Treasury's 2010-11 financial statements made reference in notes 25 to 26 of a significant number of breaches of section 83 of the constitution on payments. Nothing was done. You just breach it. Who cares? Who cares about appropriation from Parliament? We'll just spend it. Risks of Section 83 breaches from social appropriate, special appropriations and special accounts. So they set up these special little accounts. They get this big collective money that's appropriated by Parliament and they slush them into these little funds. Following consultation in August 11 between the ANAO and Department of Finance drew the attention to the agencies of the significant breaches of Section 83. The agencies disclosed a, num a number of these breaches and were told to fix the problem. Well, how do you fix it? A breach under the Constitution is illegal and void. High court case. But good news to the rescue. The Department of Finance and Deregulation is going to work with the agencies and the ANAO to develop a longer-term solution to the problem. They were finalising its advice to executives to identify and address non-compliance with Section 83. Well, how did that go? Must have been a beauty. How good was that? Well, let's have a look at a couple of uh, examples. Now, this is in a subsequent uh, reports uh, from earlier, taken from an earlier report and then uh, reviewed and reviewed and reviewed again by different governments. But this goes back to audit report number 15 in 2004 and 5, financial management of special appropriations. In one instant, an entity disclosed in 2001-2, a total spend of 7.2 billion had not been passed in appropriate legislation by parliament. Look at the bloody hell that go. And they got the hide to throw mud at me. You must be joking. 7.2 billion, not approved by parliament. And people want to put their trust in government your finances, your day-to-day -day lives. And then they, in America's case, they want to stamp it on the, on the uh, currency in God we trust to try and get an endorsement from God. That's absolute madness. As I said, eliminate all that waffle from the outside and just have a think about, through personal experience, which is what I wanted to share, as a live case example of what can happen when you let your trust go with these powers to be. Whereas the decentralised currency, you can rely on the computer knowing that one plus one equals two every time. That's it. Now, in the five-year period by the audits, 21 entities made but did not disclose a special appropriation drawings from Consolidated Revenue Fund, an additional amounts of 13.1 billion. In one instance, they didn't disclose there was 2.6 billion in payments from one other special account. Where does it all go? Now you got the tax office coming out saying we need your taxes, be a great citizen, do all that. Wah wah wah. You collect the tax, and we don't know where it's gone because it's not even appropriated by Parliament. And it doesn't stop. In 2000, in 2018, 17, Malcolm Turnbull rocks along. Liberals, you've got Morrison out there as well now. And, you know, they're all taking the lead from each other. The flies are back in again. Here we go. And what happens? The audit concluded... In the final phase of that, issues relating to no controls in entities' IT environments, no controls on user access and data management, no controls on asset management uh, processes, including accounting policy, no controls 
understanding of accounting for the disposal of assets and calculations of asset impairment or write downs, business systems and processing controls, and even reconciliation of accounts. These issues were consistent in previous audits as to the inquiry as to what's going on. And they're running the place. <laughs> it's extraordinary. I mean, I'm not talking about here and now uh, issues in relation to absolute incompetence. I mean, that's another level. Absolute incompetence is where the politicians, who the blowies are coming in and out, the bureaucrats think they know what they're doing. They're not worried about compliance. All they're worried about is Al Endres' 8.725 that breached the Constitution that's illegal and void because of their own contractor. But we've got other breaches. I mean, some of the stats outside of that. I mean, this is incredible. We're just talking about, let's talk about Social Security for a minute. This is in the... Uh, Outright breach of Section 83 again in 2018. Liberals. So we'll focus on the Liberals this time. Julie Gillard's had a bad run. Labor and Rudd before that, uh, all getting the same reports. But breaches under Section 83. In the new tax system, Family Assistance Act of 1999, there was $1.3 billion in 2014 in breach of the Constitution. Where the hell that go? But not to be outdone, in 2015, under the same provision, another $1.2 billion was in breach of 83 of the Constitution. Now, 83 is crucial. 83 is crucial. Our entire lives revolve around the integrity, the accountability of people who put their hand up, plonk their ass in Parliament and run the country and come up with some of the most ridiculous laws we've ever seen. And then they go out on their little bandwagons and stand on their boxes and tell the rest of us it's, it's crucial to pay tax. Well, it is crucial. But where's the investigations and where what's happened to all this money when they, they lose it or they don't comply with the Constitution to get the appropriate appropriations? They don't want you to know about what they're doing with the money. I mean, the Social Security Administration Act in 1999, Act of 99, there was $1.1 billion in breach of Section 83. So the highest potential breaches occurred in social services and industry social security legislation. Now, there's one account there of a breach that was admitted by the tax office in making payments for 59,000 breaches. So they do an audit, they put it in the audit file, and no one gives the stuff. Occasionally, when someone gets a few bob in their pocket and says, I've had enough, I'll go to court, I'll go to the High Court under Section 75, which is a constitutional right when the Commonwealth's involved and a question of, of uh, constitutional law, you finally get in the High Court and then you throw your trust to seven guys and girls on the bench and you hope like hell that your 50-50 chance comes up, that they read the law, and certainly in some recent cases, the Williams case uh, and the uh, church uh, cases on money, the High Court was given a whack around the, uh, the Australian government was given a whack around the ears. The court said you've been breach of 83. It's illegal and void. But then they look for ways around it. We'll try and create a debt. We'll try and waiver it. We'll try and introduce this and that. Without the reality being, they've been naughty. As Monty Python said, they've been naughty, naughty boys. Which highlights today's session on in crypto we trust. I don't need you to trust me. You need to trust the system. You need to trust the decentralization, the split chain. And it's out, it'll be out there for everybody. Others will get onto it. Others will do what they want to do with the split chain. As I've talked uh, before about how the adoption process happens and what will happen with it. And that's what will take an element 
for people that can see that we are in one of the greatest times ever, that the computer systems and the software will actually take control of what's happening to funds and money and not be deceived by suggesting that somehow God is the main player in this whole game to give endorsement to something that's fallible because of human input. That's the exact essence through my experience sharing with you. Be careful, be cautious of those in government because they're not in control themselves. Now, no one's going to take the time to read every Australian National Audit Office report. I've quite enjoyed reading them because every time you get to another uh, part of those reports, there's another uh, level of breaches of, of the various acts, breaches by those in the, in the uh, bureaucracy, those that want to have all the droppings. They don't give a shit, but they give the shit to the flies that buzz in and out that we see because we think in a democracy we're putting these people in power. So be very careful, extremely careful. Well, that's the little uh, little uh, exciting um, process that I wanted to put to you today is to tune your minds to the technology, where it's heading, because eventually if this goes the way computers will be and artificial intelligence, you won't need a government, you won't need human input, you won't need these idiots losing money, hiding money, looking for ways and avenues to breach the laws that were put in place 100 years ago, plus years, because the computer won't tolerate it. It'll just say, this is what's got to happen. One plus one equals two, and that's it. And it can reconcile itself. You can have controls and systems. I mean, blockchain is part and parcel of the reason for this evolution. Bitcoin. Why do you think it's at 55,000 US dollars? Because people are sick and tired of putting their trust in humans. You can't trust those powers to be in any part of your life that you sit here today. The regulations and the issues that are, are uh, as part of that puts at jeopardy your ability to have sound financial stability that's all you're looking for because you've got no control. But with the decentralized currency, that's the start. That's the beginnings of eliminating all of those things that I found through that journey, whether it's the, the judge that I needed in trust, whether he convinced me that he wasn't talking to his wife when he went to bed, the magistrate, but decided to issue me with a fine, whether it was Rashugi having a sleep. The computer doesn't sleep. He doesn't nod off at two o'clock, 24 seven. And the peers are in the position of power because that's the network. You don't need regulators telling you that they've got a different version of events. And at the same time, throwing mud and slinging it at you when their own files are full of thousands of breaches with no recovery, losing your money, that's the point that you need to be left with. Crypto. Crypto is the way to go. You still weed your way through that lot list of those tokens that have risks. But if you get to the right ones, then it's certainly uh, the journey. The journey will be incredible. Because the only thing you can blame is if the computer turns itself off and says, I'm not doing any more processing of that particular Bitcoin example, or in our case, the whole network would have to be shut down because it's in the control on and off. And you can go off the split chain network for five years and pop yourself back in. So it doesn't matter as long as you've got that backup, which we'll talk about. So just on that, that's it for me today. Uh, the update is very, very nice indeedy. The live uh, use of the wallet that I did uh, yesterday, and I'd go again to invite people to review, which uh, is episode 17, special edition. Uh, that was for the iPhone. We're looking at a similar one for Android. Not necessary, though, because the Android 
is a lot easier in finding the homepage to add. Just two little takeouts of that. When you see that spinning wheel going, which is the blue arrow, don't do anything. Just let it spin, right? Don't get overexerting yourself to want to press things. Let the damn thing spin because that's, that can cause you problems if you're not letting it go through into the network. It knows what it's got to do. Doesn't need your help. Doesn't need human input. This is the trust thing again. It knows what it's got to do. The software says keep spinning. It's only a matter of seconds, minute tops. And you saw how fast that was. Let it spin because that's its job. It's a little spinny thing. Now, on one of the pages, it was brought to our attention that when I came to confirm the send transaction, uh, people couldn't see the cancel button. Well, I should have scrolled down a bit because at the top, and uh, this is picked up by my marketing team, which is the cosmetics that we can look at, there is a button that says back. So if you press the back button, it takes you back to the transaction and doesn't confirm. Now, a lot of people like the word cancel. So we're going to look at that and whether we throw a button in there that says cancel. Um, you know, that's the sort of couple of inputs from that part of it. But other than that, uh, the video is there. It's it's If you go to the zoocoins.com, uh, you know, scroll right down to the bottom. We put it down the bottom because uh, a lot of the attention is all about the material information people know about zoo coins on the website. But scroll right down the bottom and you'll see Zoo Time and it'll have special edition that you can re-watch that. When you do watch it, guess what? Download it. And then you don't have to worry about where is it. Download it, or save it, send it, whatever you want to do so that you can look back and see exactly the process so that we won't be getting any calls or any problems or people worked up about how to use the wallet. We will have a separate edition on the backup. So just stay tuned for that. Um, those that have now seen the video who have the live wallets are certainly making excellent progress. And uh, as I said uh, yesterday, They'll still get the opportunity to work their way through next week and uh, come back to us. And we're getting imminently, imminently close. And let's uh, let's enjoy this moment. So thanks, everybody. I'm Alan Andres. It's, uh, you know, be safe, be zoo kind, because it's zoo time. Cheers, everybody. <laughs>